All right, mute. Test. Okay.
will be interested to see. Wait, can I hear myself? Okay, we'll see if the music is in there. Oh, okay, that was just loud. All right, it's time to turn this back on and do this with zero viewers. All right. That's okay. You've assured me you're watching it later. Let me get into this window. Oh, this is going to be annoying, but that's okay. I forgot my mouse, so I got to use my pad on my laptop okay so section two how pathogens oh I can use yeah I can and P how pathogens cause disease the learning objectives include the ability to summarize Koch postulates and molecular Koch postulates respectively and explain their significance and limitations. Explain the concept of pathogenicity, virulence, in terms of infectious and lethal dose. Distinguish between primary and opportunistic pathogens and identify specific examples of each. Summarize the stages of pathogenesis and explain the roles of portals of entry and exit in the transmission of disease and identify specific examples of these portals. I guess if anyone that's not in this course that's going to watch this, uh, I don't know that you need this warning, but there's going to be a nude cartoon coming up, you know, when you're addressing portals of entry for disease. Okay. Anyway, Koch's postulates. There are four of them. And uh, here's basically how it goes. So the suspected pathogen, the causative agent of disease, must be found in every case of disease and not be found in healthy individuals. The pathogen must be able to be isolated. So that's where the streak for isolation comes into here. And grown in pure culture. And uh, number three, a healthy test subject infected with the suspected pathogen must develop the same signs and symptoms of disease as seen in postulate one. Following that, the pathogen must be re-isolated from the new host and must be identical to the pathogen from postulate two. So this is really straightforward for certain types of diseases, but there are some problems trying to use this universally. Okay, so the first problem is, re refers to the fact that the pathogen not found in healthy individuals. As we already know, opportunistic pathogens are routinely part of normal flora. Number two, uh, all healthy subjects equally susceptible to disease. That's an assumption in the Koch's postulates. That is not true. Individuals have varying level of susceptibility. And then number three is a sticky point as well. Pathogens must be isolable in pure culture. A very small percentage of all prokaryotes are culturable, estimated at two to three percent. And as examples of pathogens that we know cause specific diseases that are unable to be isolated in pure culture include rickettsia and chlamydia because they are obligate intracellular parasites. Despite these problems, uh, the basic Koch postulates approach has been applied uh, very extensively in molecular biology. So much so that we have what we call the molecular Koch's postulates. So uh, at this level, the uh, first postulate is the phenotype. So the sign or symptom of the disease 
should be associated only with pathogenic strains of a species. So we're talking about differences in Escherichia coli. There's the example listed here. So there's the enterotoxigenic version, ETEC, and enterohemorrhagic version, uh, version, the O157H7 mutant. These are uh, still Escherichia coli, but these are strains that have additional capabilities, this kind of pathogenesis. So the, um, well, the application to the enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli, it causes intestinal inflammation and diarrhea, whereas non-pathogenic strains of E. coli do not. All right, postulate two, the inactivation of the suspected genes associated with pathogenicity should result in a measurable loss of pathogenicity. This is, um, well, this is behind everything that we do that involves gene knockouts uh, for any kind of metabolic uh, capability or activity, uh, inactivating the genes either in real time with some kind of a silencing strategy or by flat out deleting them from the organism's genome um, and a few things in between. So one of the genes in the enterohemorrhagic E. coli encodes for the Shiga toxin and uh, inactivating that gene reduces the bacteria's ability to cause disease. So reversion of the inactivated gene should restore the disease phenotype. And by experimentation, if you re-add that gene that you knocked out, then you have restored EHEC's ability to cause disease. This is also, this kind of reversion is also pretty much expected when you're doing molecular research of any kind, trying to associate a particular function with a particular gene. You should be able to knock it out and then restore it. Um, that would be the gold standard. Sorry, my eyes went funny there because I don't know if that's literally written down somewhere as the gold standard, but that's definitely an expectation of these kinds of experiments is that you can remove the gene. Uh, you should observe, um, if your hypothesis is correct, you should observe that whatever function that was associated with that disease is indeed uh, no longer there. And then you should be able to restore it uh, sometimes you can do this down to, I shouldn't say sometimes, say many people do often, uh, where you modify particular subunits of that gene instead of just knocking the whole thing out or temporary silencing and then relieving the silencing and then observing the, that functionality restored. Now the limit, uh, one of the limits of the molecular Koch postulates is not all pathogens are subject to molecular manipulation to that degree or have a suitable host animal to carry this out in. Okay, now some more terminology. We're talking about pathogenicity and virulence. So pathogenicity is simply the ability of a microbial agent to cause disease. That's pretty straightforward. Virulence is the degree to which an organism is pathogenic. This is not a discrete uh, quantitative value, uh, but this does exist on a continuum. Organisms that are highly virulent almost always lead to disease. And uh, organisms with low virulence will produce mild signs and symptoms down to being asymptomatic. So Bacillus anthracis, when viewed through this lens, we have it's highly virulent, particularly if inhaled. And it has these characters, um, its ability to, the spores to germinate, cause swelling, hypoxia, necrosis, uh, sorry, necrosis, and the bacteria is able to rapidly enter the bloodstream. Another thing that we can consider a virulence factor explicitly include the passive defenses the pathogen have so that they are more able to cause disease by evading the immune system. Apparently not everyone agrees on that. They want to go more of the attack capacities are more indicative of virulence than the defense capacities. But uh, I don't think there's like a real controversy there. 
Okay, so how we measure pathogenicity and virulence is based on how much of the organism it takes to infect 50% of inoculated animals as the median infectious dose, ID50. So number of cells or virons required to cause active infection. Whereas the median lethal dose is the number of pathogenic cells, virons, or amount of toxin required to kill 50% of infective, infected animals, LD50. LD50, you might see more commonly when talking about the toxicity of certain chemicals or um, how dangerous particular dosages of radiation can be. And here's a cartoon of what that looks like. Here we go. A little picture of that. Percent mortality in experimental groups compared to the number of pathogenic agents. So you can plot this out and then calculate an LD50. Wait, what's different here? Now this is the same thing in two different ways. Sorry guys, it's the same. That one's probably uh, better. The next one should be deleted. Okay, here's an example of some infectious dose, 50% for some food board, borne diseases. So hepatitis A, you can see you have a range of 10 to the one to 10 to the two. I'm not gonna read all these, of course, but let's pick out some more. So the enteropathogenic, E. coli, uh, you see you need a whole, whole lot of cells in order to cause disease in 50% of infected animals. Whereas the enterohemorrhagic, the O157H7 strain, uh, is much more virulent, much more pathogenic, because you're back down to 10 to the first, uh, 10 to the second number of cells as compared to the number of virons for the hep A Oh, the norovirus is more infectious. But here's an example of what these things look like. So Girardia, um, Lamblia, which we haven't really talked about, the protozoans, just one. <laughs> That's all you need. And Vibrio cholera. It still takes quite a few cells to ensure infection in half the population. So, yeah. So Salmonella enterica, this particular serovar, is um, really highly is highly pathogenic as well. Okay. So primary versus opportunistic pathogens. So a primary path pathogen can cause disease in a host regardless of the host's resident microbiota or immune system. Examples include the enterohemorrhagic E. coli and uh, via this Shigella toxin. Opportunistic pathogens can only cause disease when the host's immune system is compromised in some way, like the ever-present Staphylococcus epidermidis that is on your skin right now is the most frequent uh, cause of nosocomial disease, so hospital-acquired infections. Candida overgrowth in a high antibiotic background is another example of an opportunistic pathogen. Because normally you have a, a lower pH thanks to organisms like lactobacillus and that inhibits candida. When those are gone, uh, candida is able to overgrow quite readily. Okay. Stages of pathogenesis. We have exposure, you know, contact first, adhesion, invasion, infection. So the first stage, exposure or contact, a lot of organisms, we have different portals of entry where pathogens can gain access into the body. And with the exception of the placenta, uh, many of these locations are directly exposed to the external environment. So these are our vulnerable points, uh, breaks in skins on all of our openings. And of course, uh, needle, insect bite, uh, yeah, portals of entry, mouth, nose, vagina, anus, urethra.
Okay, so mucosal surfaces are the most important entry for microbes, especially respiratory or via the respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, genital urinary tracts, and uh, most path most <laughs> most pathogens have a particular portal that they are well suited for. And there's the uh, parenternal route. That's where pathogens are entered through a uh, breach and protective barriers of skin and mucosal membranes, such as open wounds. Speaking of the placenta, there are uh, there's a particular grouping of organisms that are specialized to be able to do that. And these are called the torch infections, the diseases are. So T is for toxoplasmosis. This is from Toxoplasma gondii. Uh, these, this is the one that can be persistent in uh, cat feces. Make sure the cat's not paying attention to me. No, she's not. So that's why they say pregnant women shouldn't be changing litter boxes, as an example. The O in torch includes uh, syphilis, chicken pox, hepatitis B, HIV, and the fifth disease, which I always have to be careful to say. Because when I see it, I keep trying to make it into filth disease, since filth is something we commonly associate to, with disease, or that's just me, and now I've infected you with that. I'm sorry. Fifth disease. And there's our the agents that cause those. Uh, we have rubella, that's the R in torch, caused by toga virus. C, cytomegalovirus. And uh, an example is humans herpes virus 5. And H, herpes can cross the placenta. That would be HSV types 1 and 2. And then some other pathogens are of concern during passage through the birth canal, like cl chlamydia, gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea, as examples. So torch. It'll be important to know, especially for you pre-meds. Here we go. Okay, part two. Our 10-year-old Michael is at the clinic. Physician takes down his medical history and asks about activities and diet. And upon learning that Michael became sick the day after the party, the physician orders a blood test to check for pathogens associated with foodborne diseases. After the test confirms the presence of a gram-positive rod in Michael's blood, he is given an injection of a broad-spectrum antibiotic and sent to a nearby hospital where he is admitted. And there he receives intravenous antibiotic therapy and fluids. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and talk through these answers, I guess. Is this bacterium in Michael's blood part of normal microbiota? Trick question. Uh, there should be no bacteria... Um, no bacteria in your blood at all. That's a terrible place for bacteria to be. Terrible for you. I guess mostly for them it's a party. And then portal of entry, you know, we have oral, right? I guess we'll see. All right, next is adhesion. Oh, yeah, we were done there. Okay. So adhesion, the capability of the would-be pathogen or the pathogenic microbe to attach to the cells of the body using adhesion factors. So the class of adhesions, these are proteins and carbohydrates that are able to bind to receptors on host cells. In bacteria, these adhesins will be on fimbrae and flagella, on protozoans, on cilia, and in viruses on the capsid or membrane. Glycocalyxes, remember our slime layers and our capsules, they can facilitate uh, adhesion as well as performing their function of evading, helping evade the immune system. And then biofilm growth, glycocalyxes, extra polymeric substances, these all help with adhesion. So particularly when we're talking about things, uh, this is a staphylococcus. But here is a bio, bi biofilm being produced by organisms on a catheter. And yeah, so that's adhesion. Invasion, 
the ability for the pathogen to disseminate throughout the tissue or body or into the uh, cells, the invasion um, when they enter the host cell, the intracellular pathogens do, like the rickettsia and the chlamydia I mentioned earlier. So specific virulence factors determine the degree of tissue damage, um, and they use exoenzymes, toxins to accomplish that. And virulence factors include substances that help evade the immune system. Now, this textbook, this OpenStax textbook, uh, does include this uh, in there talking about invasion and in the microbial pathogenesis class I took in 2013 12 because that wasn't terribly long ago uh, talked about how some researchers don't like to include uh, passive factors as uh, virulence factors and I see that point but I like this point better to be honest Okay, here's an example of how Helicobacter pylori is able to invade the lining of the stomach and they produce, um, so we're calling the, um, oh, what was it, urease? Oh, wait, yeah, it says it right here on the figure. <laughs> urease, uh, which neutralizes the stomach acid in its immediate local environment. And that causes the mucin to liquefy and the bacterium can swim right through. Okay, uh, inner space. <laughs> it's a reference to an 80s movie, which isn't going to make a lot of sense to most people now. All right, but anyway, here we're talking about cellular entry and... Primarily, this is mediated by inducing endocytosis. So the pathogen's effector proteins uh, will include protrusions of membrane ruffles, hence membrane ruffling, salmonella, and shigella. These are able to bind host cell receptors, signaling the cell to initiate endocytosis. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis uses invasion binding uh, beta-1 integrins. If you take cell with Dr. Canning, you're definitely going to talk about integrants, if you haven't already. Okay, so evading disintegration and phagocytosis is critical to pathogen survival. That makes sense. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can do this, but largely if you can prevent the lysosome um, from fusing from your endocytosed uh, pa pathogen here, then you will be safe from being disintegrated. Listeria monocytogenes and Shigella, they lyse the, face, the phagosome before it can fuse with the lysosome. So this is early escape, viruses binding inhibition. Okay, so back to our pathogen cycle. We have infection. Oh, and the infections can be characterized a few different ways. We can have a local infection. These are ones that are confined to a small area, typically near the portal of entry. Staphylococcus aureus, the boils that it can cause, it can induce urinary tract infections and pneumonia. These infections tend to be local. And then you can have focal infections. Some of this can be seen as the progression to uh, not all pathogens. They'll start as a local infection, spread to become focal and then systemic. But these are examples that are tend to be isolated into these categories. All right, so uh, focal infection is a localized pathogen or its toxins have spread to a secondary location. Streptococcus can spread around. Um, yeah, to another location. Then we have systemic infections. That's an infection that gets disseminated throughout the entire body, such as chickenpox, varicella zoster. And of course, the primary infection can lead to or facilitate a secondary infection. That's particularly true with HIV, as we know, as it's specifically attacking you know, the uh, immune system. But influenza, this is a um, pneumonia is a common co-infection with influenza. And then candida as well. This book likes to talk about candida quite a bit. And then, of course, we have transmission to complete the cycle. 
and the uh, pathogen leaves the body of an infected host through various portals of exit to infect new hosts. So if you can be aerosolized, that's a really good way to get spread. Uh, but again, all the same portals of entry can be portals of exit. And that's the end of section two. Section three, virulence factors of bacterial and viral pathogens. What's our time looking like? Okay, good. All right, sorry, I'm gonna take a look. What's, um, do, 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 do. oh wait, no, I can see right there, 30 more slides, okay. Uh, I guess we're not gonna get into chapter 16. That's, that's okay. All right, so learning objectives. Explain how virulence factors contribute to signs and symptoms of infectious disease Differentiate between endotoxins and exotoxins. Describe and differentiate between various types of exotoxins. Describe the mechanisms viruses use for adhesion and antigenic variation. So first of all, some virulence factors for adhesion. So Streptococcus pyogenes, the pathogen that causes strep throat, has protein F that is able to adhere to respiratory epithelial cells. Streptococcus mutans, which is a very common uh, mouth flora organism that contributes to the laying down of the EPS uh, that comprises plaque, uses adhesion P1, attaches to the teeth, um, Neisseria gonorrhea, has a, uses a type 4 pili, and that's specialized to urethral epithelial cells. We have our enterotoxigenic E. coli, causing traveler's diarrhea, uses a type 1 fimbre to target intestinal epithelial cells, as does Vibrio cholera, but using a different method, using the N-methylphenylalanine pili. So virulence factors for invasion. We have exoenzymes and toxins. And in the bloodstream, if you can get into the bloodstream, you have the advantage in that you have an access to nearly all cells. Disadvantage is that there are numerous immune system elements in the bloodstream. Bacteremia is what we use to describe the presence of bacteria in blood. When pyogens, pus-forming bacteria, are involved, it's pyemia. Viremia is uh, the detection of viruses in the blood. Toxemia, toxins, septicemia is worse than bacteremia because this is where bacteria are not only present but are also actively multiplying and growing in the blood. Uh, patients with septicemia are described as being septic, and this can readily lead to shock, in which systolic pressure dropped below 90. Yeah, this is a really bad state to be in. All right, so part three of 10-year-old Michael's bad hot dog experience. So yeah, the presence of bacteria in blood is bad, is always bad. There's not a good bacteria in the blood. No indication that the bacteria entered through an injury. It appears that the portal of entry was the gastrointestinal route. Based on Michael's symptoms and the result of the blood test and the fact that he was the only one in the family to partake of the hot dogs, the physician suspects that Michael is suffering from a case of listeriosis. Listeria monocytogenes is a facultative intracellular pathogen that causes listeriosis. It's a common contaminant in ready-to-eat foods such as lunch meats and dairy products. Once ingested, these bacteria invade intestinal epithelial cells and translocate to the liver where they grow inside hepatic cells. Listeriosis is fatal in about 1 in 5 normal healthy people. We're hitting 20% there. And mortality rates are slightly higher in patients with pre-existing conditions that weaken the immune system. A cluster of virulence genes encoded on a pathogenicity island 
Okay, so that we haven't mentioned that term before, a lot of these virulence genes tend to occur in clusters. And we refer to that as a pathogenicity island. So these genes are regulated by a transcriptional factor known as peptide chain release factor 1, PRFA. Uh, one of the genes regulated by PRFA is HYL, which encodes a toxin known as Listeriolysin O L L O, which allows the bacterium to escape vacuoles upon entry into a host cell. A second gene regulated by PRFA is ACT A, which encodes for a surface protein known as actin assembly inducing protein. Here we go. Yeah. ACT A is expressed on the surface of Listeria and polymerizes host actin. This enables the bacterium to produce actin tails move around the cell cytoplasm and spread from cell to cell without exiting into the extracellular compartment. That's really interesting. Okay. Michael's condition has begun to worsen. He's now experiencing a stiff neck and hemiparesis, weakness on one side of the body. Concerned that the, new, that the infection is spreading, the physician decides to conduct additional tests to determine what is causing these new symptoms. So what is this an example of? <laughs> I forgot. All right. So this is the example of edema of swelling in the right hand. And this can occur when gram-negative cells are engulfed by phagocytes, releasing tumor necrotic factors, which bind capillaries, increasing their permeability. So endotoxin action there. Exoenzymes. Here are some classes and their targets. So our glycohydrolases, these degrade hyaluronic acid that cement cells together to promote the spreading through tissues. Excuse me. Nucleases, like the DNAs produced by Staph aureus, DNA auger, we, I don't think we do that in lab anymore. Maybe we should bring that back. DNA auger is kind of fun. Or wait, we never did that at Murray. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, nucleases, uh, one of the functions is to degrade DNA released by dying cells uh, that can trap the bacteria thus promoting the spread. Phospholipases, like the phospholipase C of Bacillus anthracis, straight up degrade the phospholipid bilayer of the host cell, which will cause the cell to lice. This also allows for escape from a phagosome. Proteases, collagenases in clostridium perfringes. So this degrades collagen in connective, in connective tissue to promote the spread of the pathogen. But also proteases are great if you're making cheese. Don't get that really cheap rennet though. I tried that once and it was a waste of time. So again, these are classes, uh, these are chemicals that facilitate invasion or support the uh, growth of the organism defend against the immune system. We have a cartoon for that next. Here we go. So hyaluronidase, able to degrade the binding between cells, helping allow the bacteria to slip between the epidermal cells. So DNases again, phospholipases, uh, and proteases, including collagenase. Phospholipases are specific to the type of phospholipid and have a particular action of cleavage. And with DNAs, you're degrading DNA as a means of escaping and spreading. Staphylococcus aureus being adroit in this capability. So in this illustration here, we're looking at another depiction of the of collagen getting degraded and the passage of pathogens through there. 
allowing bacteria to enter the bloodstream. So toxins, biological poisons that assist in invasion and causing damage. Toxigenicity, the ability of a pathogen to produce toxins. Endotoxins, these are molecules released by pathogens upon cell death, like the lipopolysaccharide, the lipid A portion is toxic. It induces an inflammatory response that is similar to that induced by tumor necrosis factor. Here is that picture again. You should remember where this is from, where the LPS lives. Wait, does it mention that? Let's see. Do, do, do. So you, you know which gram reaction you would get in a cell that has LPS. Hopefully. It's gram negative. Okay. The outer membrane, right? So uh, here are some toxins. Exotoxins are mostly produced by gram-positive bacteria and are very specific in their action. As converse to the endotoxin, which has a induces a uniform uh, inflammatory response. But comparing the two, let's see, gram-negative bacteria producing endotoxins, gram-positive mostly producing exotoxins. Uh, the lipid A component of the lipopolysaccharide. Exotoxins are protein. Effect on the host. Uh, we have a general systemic symptoms or inflammation and fever of the endotoxin, whereas the exotoxin have a specific, do uh, specific damage to cells dependent, and that damage or ability to interact is dependent upon receptor-mediated targeting of cells and specific mechanisms of action. Endotoxin is heat stable. Most exotoxins are heat labile, meaning they can be denatured and made uh, ineffective by the application of heat. LD50 for endotoxin is high and low for exotoxins. Here are some examples. So intracellular targeting toxins include those produced by the uh, bivibrio cholera, clostridium tetani, clostridium botulinum, corinobacterium diphtheria, and these are some of their mechanisms and their names. Generally, we take the disease and then put toxin after it to help tell you uh, to identify that particular toxin. So intracellular targeting, membrane disrupting, and here are some examples of this. So C is mentioned previously uh, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this is the phospholipase groups. Of course, we are degrading the cell membrane, uh, causing cell death. And then these are proteins that will create pores through cell membranes, and that will also kill the cells. Strep, 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 staph. And then we have a group of toxins called superantigens. These cause uh, in problems including toxic shock syndrome. So they simulate excessive activation of immune system cells and releases of cytokines from immune system cells. Life-threatening fever, inflammation, and shock are the result. So a little more detail talking about intracellular targeting toxins. These are AB toxins, meaning they have an A and a B component. And the B component is the portion of the toxin that is able to bind the receptor. And in this cartoon, uh, we bound a receptor with our AB toxin. We have induced endocytosis and then inside the vacuole, the A component separates and is able to, well, in this case, escape the vacuole and get access to the cytoplasm. So again, our cholera toxin, our tetanus toxin, botulinum, and diphtheria toxins. So talking about cholera toxin, it causes the activation of adenylate cyclase and in intestinal cells, causing increasing levels of CAMP, 
and secretion of fluids and electrolytes out of cells, out of the cell causing diarrhea. So cholera toxin is an enterotoxin consisting of one A subunit and five B subunits. The B subunits will bind to receptors on the intestinal epithelial cells. After entry, the A activates intracellular G proteins, causing the activation of adenyl cyclase, increasing CAMP. This is the rice water stool type of diarrhea. Here's the mechanism of the diphtheria toxin. It inhibits protein synthesis. This is, uh, so the B binds out here. Let's see, the A subunit inactivates, yeah, elongation factor two by transferring an ADP ribose. This causes protein synthesis to stop and will kill the cell. So you're interfering here with the ribosome with elongation factor two specifically. So botulinum toxin, so the lethal dose here is measured. So the median le lethal dose in a human uh, is 1.3 to 2.1 nanograms per kilogram of mass. If you've never tried to work with nanograms of a material, you're in for a treat. It's really, really hard. And that is intravenously or intramuscularly, it's down to 1.3 nanograms per kilogram will kill half of the people that receive that dose. And 10 to 13 nanograms per kilogram when inhaled. So I'm talking specifically about if the uh, botulinum toxin got inhaled, not the pathogen. The pathogen's route of entry, uh, in, if you inhale the spores, that's its uh, best chance to establish disease. So anyway, the botulinum toxin has a light A subunit with a heavy B subunit. The B subunit binds neurons, allowing entry into the neuromuscular junction. And then uh, component A, subunit A, is a protease. It cleaves the proteins involved in acetylcholine release. So this induces permanent flaccid paralysis. And of course, um, punching laterally, I guess, here we go with men choosing to have their scrotums Botoxed, I guess, to make it look smoother. I don't know. <laughs> no, I can't, whatever. Okay. Uh, tetanus toxin has a light A subunit, heavy B subunit. It binds inhibitory and inhibitory binds inhibitory interneurons. Oh, dang it, I ran out of time. Okay, so much fun. Glycine and GABA, so inhibiting acetylcholine. Uh, tetanus inhibits, causing permanent muscle contraction. So we're, we're binding inhibitory interneurons, and it typically culminates re with respiratory failure and death. And here's what Goop has to say about tetanus. Just clean the wound, reduce the potential for bacteria to enter the bloodstream. And then use colloidal silver. Uh, get the damn vaccine is what you need to do. You need to have had done already. Ugh. Anyway. So here's a cartoon for the botulinum toxin and the tetanus toxins uh, mechanisms of action. So acetylcholine is stored in vesicles, um, synaptic vesicles that fuse and are and, and release acetylcholine to induce the muscle cell to contract. Those of you in animal phys can already explain this in much greater detail. So botulinum toxin blocks the release of acetylcholine, stopping the muscle contraction permanently. So the tetanus toxin, we are preventing the release of glycine and GABA, preventing relaxation of the muscle. Other exotoxins, we have our membrane disrupting toxins mentioned earlier, and we're either de degrading the membrane or forming pores 
into the membrane. Streptococcus pyogenes is pretty good at this. And uh, chemicals like hemolysins and leukocytins. And then we have our superantigens, excessive non-specific immune inflammatory response, including toxic shock syndrome caused by Staphylococcus aureus, mostly associated with vaginal colonization. So, yeah. Okay, so virulence factors for survival in host and immune evasion. Some examples of this. So there is a capsule involved here. The uh, antibody, if it can bind to the bacterial cell, recruiting a phagocytic cell. Um, let's see here. So that's the normal function, right? You're binding to the pathogen mediated by the antibody but uh, some bacteria produce proteases that are able to destroy the antibodies and then the capsule itself can prevent the antibody from recognizing the, that there's a pathogen here so passive uh, the capsule like I mentioned resistant to recognition uh, mycolic acid and, uh, and the acid fast bacteria to resist dissolution. Active virulence factors for survival. Proteases, if you can break down the antibodies. And then host exploitation strategies that include the use of coagulase in Staphylococcus aureus that will cause the bacteria to get coated in the host fibrin that will hide it and then the use of kinases to dissolve a clot, staphylo and streptokinases. All right, resolution. Based on Michael's reported symptoms, uh, the physician suspects the infection may have spread to his nervous system. Physician orders a spinal tap, uh, looking for bacteria that may have invaded the meninges and cerebrospinal fluid. And let's see, needle to the tie, inserted, fluided. And the specimen is divided into three separate serial tubes, each with one mil of CSF. It's immediately taken to the hospital lab, where it's analyzed by the clinical chemistry, hematology, and microbiology departments. And they have determined that there's a cerebrospinal infection occurring with the microbiology department reporting the presence of a gram-positive rod in Michael's CSF. The result confirms what his physician has suspected. Michael's new symptoms are the result of meningitis, acute inflammation of the membranes that protect the brain and spinal cord. Because meningitis can be life-threatening, and because the first antibiotic therapy was not effective in preventing the spread of infection, Michael has prescribed an aggressive course of two antibiotics, ampicillin and gentamicin, to be delivered intravenously. He remains hospital, uh, hospitalized for several weeks for supportive care and for observation. After a week, he is allowed to return home for bed rest and oral antibiotics. After three weeks, he makes a full recovery. All right. So that one was a good story uh, as well, or had a good outcome. Let's see here, 66. All right, I'm gonna end, uh, finish this section and then we'll briefly go over valence factors of eukaryotic pathogens on Wednesday. So antigenic uh, variation. This is why the flu vaccine uh, both have a challenging efficacy and have to be reformulated every year. And that is the result of both antigenic drift and antigenic shift. So in antigenic drift, uh, mutations in the genes for surface proteins, neuraminidase and or hemagglutinin result in small antigenic changes over time. As you would expect with something with the word drift in it, especially being familiar with genetic drift, hopefully, our primarily our primary attachment mediators here are the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And so if you mutate that a little bit, then the vaccine for the previous version, um, previous vaccine might not be as effective. Then we can have a more dramatic 
shift where we have two different viruses that infect the same cell get uh, packaged into essentially a new virus or a new strain and where you have the neuraminidase from one and the hemagglutinin from the other and that's antigenic variation overall and that's what makes influenza so challenging what is being worked on and it should be close to being worked out by now is using a uh, antigen here on the stalk this is our neuraminidase such that or the hemagglutinin uh, the stalk proteins are far less variable than the domains at the heads and this would allow a basically a permanent um, immunity to most all of the influenza viruses the mechanism would be a little bit different and that the cell would still be able to or, sorry the virus would still be able to bind and it would get phagocytosed but if you had a bunch of antibody blocking up these stalks the virus won't be able to uh, complete its life cycle all right so that brings us to the end of section three that's only like now i'm going to power through this most of y'all aren't watching this live anyway so you know give me a few more minutes here i'm just going to briefly go over some of the virulence factors of eukaryotic pathogens because this is little literally only uh four slides effectively so let's just go right through this so describe virulence factors unique to fungi and parasites compare virulence factors of fungi and bacteria explain the difference between protozoan parasites and helminths describe how helminths evade the host immune system so candida uh, they have adhesins that are surface glycoproteins they also use proteases phospholipases and they're able to degrade keratin cryptococcus produces a capsule uh, fungal exotoxins are called mycotoxins reasonably uh, calviceps purpurea produces the ergotoxin causes ergoism it's a gangrenous and convulsive convulsion and speaking of which i totally forgot to tell the zookeepers yesterday that uh, we went to the zoo just for so the boys could feed the giraffes because they only do that on the weekends in the off season but they um one of the meerkats was seizing up for like two minutes and i should have recorded it but i didn't even think about it because i kept thinking it was just like it was a bit of play weird kind of play but it looked totally like a seizure and uh, that was kind of sad i still need to let them know i mean they probably already know you know like the time i found the the rats the city norwegian rats in the uh blue macaw i'm sorry that's totally off topic but that was really disturbing <laughs> i mean the rats were eating the food while the birds just watched yeah Okay, protozoan virulence, some examples. Uh, Giardia lamblia uses uh, an adhesive disc composed of microtubules to attach to the intestinal mucosa. And mechanically, it's like a suction cup. Plasmodium falciparum, our malaria organism, uses antigenic variation. And it has the uh, adhesin PFEMP1. It's expressed on the surface of infected urethrocytes, causing clumping. Helminth virulence in Schistosoma mansoni. It penetrates the intact skin with the aid of proteases that degrade skin proteins like elastins and is able to degrade host antibodies. Now, large worms are protected in part by just their size. Obviously, they can't be engulfed. And uh, they also employ, the helminths employ uh, mimicry. Uh, they express glycans that mimic host glycans. Glycan mimicry. Like, it's almost like lichen. Okay. Anyway, uh, that's the end of that chapter. So now I can give you an assignment and make sure I gave you the other assignment before. But we'll see. All right. I'll see you all Wednesday. Take care. I need a smooth way to be able to turn this off. So I gotta go over here, pull this up, and stop. Hey, two viewers, woo, go me.
stop broadcast. All right, again, um, 